Welcome to God, Sex, and You, a daily discipleship podcast on healthy sexuality. Here's your host, Purity Pastor, Dustin Daniels. Last week, we started a brand new series on the topic of the theology of the human body. And we started our discussion off on the specific subject of gender. And by the way, that phrase, that title there is interesting, isn't it? It comes from the theology of the body uh, from Pope John Paul II. It's a series of writings from him. And if you are interested in learning more on that topic, let me point you to a colleague of mine. His name is Christopher West, and he is an expert on the theology of the body uh, with Pope John Paul II. And you can visit him at ChristopherWest.com. Today, we continue our series on gender. And we're going to take a lengthy look at the importance of theology when it comes to gender. Uh, Theology just being the study of God with our emphasis on the human body. So in today's podcast, we're going to discuss several things. Number one, the four mysteries of the human body. Number two, how Christianity is very, very different in its theology towards the human body. And number three, What is the hypostatic union? That's a big, fancy theological term. Well, what's it mean? Well, let's get started and find out. Today's lesson is titled, The Importance of Your Gender Theology. As we get into the theology of the human body, we're going to notice some of the stuff that you guys have already touched on. There's many mysteries to all of this. I want to point out four. We're not going to get into a a lengthy conversation on this. Um, But there are four mysteries of the human body. Number one, the mysteries of the gender differences. Uh, The mystery of a a one flesh sexual union. The mystery of Christ's communion with his church. Someone mentioned that word commune last session. I love to hear that. It was excellent. And then the mystery of the, of the communion itself between Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. These four points are all progressive, meaning that the more that you learn about this mystery between the gender differences, the more it's going to point you to the mystery of the one flesh, the one flesh union between those, those gender differences, and so forth and so on. So to understand the theology of the body, to understand the the human body, we must look at how Christianity is different. When most people talk about religion, they focus on the spiritual side of things, right? But see, this is where Christianity is is different. It's very different. Why? Because God himself chose to step down off his throne where angels sang, holy Holy, holy, continuously, he stepped down off his throne and humbled himself to become a man, Zakar. Right? It's called the incarnation. God becomes flesh. God becomes a male. Isaiah 9, 6, for, us to, for to us a child is born, to us a son is given, And the government shall be upon his shoulders, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, and Prince of Peace. Matthew 1.18, now the birth of Jesus Christ took place this way. When his mother Mary had been betrothed to Joseph, before they came together, she was found to be with a child from the Holy Spirit. Is that a little mysterious? John 1.14, the Word became flesh. He dwelt among us, and we have seen His glory, and the glory is the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. That grace and truth there is critical. We'll talk about that uh, tomorrow as well. The Apostle John writes, That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we've seen with our own eyes, We've seen this man, which we looked upon and we've touched. We've touched this man with our own hands. See, many church people get real nervous when we start talking about the human body. 
Some even teach that the human body is bad or evil. Have you heard that? I mean, that's just complete heresy. If you look at Jesus Christ as the incarnation, God with us, that is heresy. Completely uh, contrary and incompatible to Christian doctrine. Because if that were true, he wouldn't have chosen to become a man and to save us from our sins. Now, God is spirit. We can't see him. You cannot see my face, for man shall not see me and live. And yet, God revealed himself as a person, specifically as a man, Jesus Christ, through a human male body. It's called the hypostatic union. The combination of divine human nature in the single person of Christ. That's a mystery. Lots of mysteries going on. So let's back up. Turn your Bibles to Ephesians 5. I've, uh, let's look at another mystery here as we discuss the theology of the human body. Ephesians 5, we're going to start in verses 25 and go through 32. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her, that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of the water with the word, so that he might present the church to himself in splendor, without spot, without wrinkle, or any such thing, that she might be holy and without blemish. And by the way, husbands, you husbands, you should love your wives as your own body. He who loves his wife loves himself, for no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes it, cherishes it, just as Christ does the church. Verse 30, because we're all members of his body. Verse 31, Therefore a man shall leave his father and a mother and hold fast to his wife. The two shall become one flesh. Verse 32, this mystery is profound. And I'm saying that it refers to Christ and the church. These two people, this, the two shall become one. This mystery, it's profound. It's not like a mystery we're used to. It really refers to God's eternal plan for humanity. It's a mystery because we are so far beyond even comprehending the mystery. It's like trying to teach your dog quantum physics. Paul, the Apostle Paul, points us back to Genesis 2.24. Why does he do that? Is it possible that God created us male and female, so that we, as the image bearers of Almighty God, that we can represent and reflect God's love for us by loving one another. That our marriages, if you will, are a lowercase m marriage. And this marriage that Paul's talking about, Christ and the church, is a capital M marriage. So that our lowercase marriages here reflect the way that I treat Amy is a reflection of how Christ treats me. That there is a beauty that's reflected by our marriage. Not just me, not just her, but us together. Is it so that we could experience a, a unique communion that is so special that it's only shared by husband and wife? Is it possible that the sexual union between husband and wife is a physical representation of a holy and sacred spiritual reality? That our marriage is a physical representation of a spiritual reality. We can't see the reality. You guys were already talking about it in the first lesson. That this marriage that we have, that no matter where you are in your marriage, if things are really tough or if things are really great, 
that God is in the midst of that, and it's through that to where there is a spiritual reality that we can't see what's going on. This is something so much bigger than ourselves. So key point number one. When we tinker with God's plan of gender, when we tinker with God's plan of sexuality, we're actually tinkering with human existence. So I want you to think about this. The human race is dependent on who's having sex with who. When you tinker with human existence, I mean, basically, when you take one person out of the equation, the whole family tree's gone. So when we start tinkering with people, Zakar, Nekeva, we tinker with people who are made in the image of God. Which God said, it's very good. Let's also make sure that we understand that all of this stuff that we, we talked about at the very beginning of the lesson, that is all called sin. Trying to change my gender. Now, if you were Satan, wouldn't you want to blur the lines between male and female? Wouldn't that be part of your strategy to confuse people? What about confusing the definition of marriage and, and having governments create laws that approve of sin itself? Would that be part of your strategy? We talked about this being a spiritual warfare last month. That's exactly what this is, right? Doesn't that make sense? That if you were Satan, wouldn't you want to blur the lines of all things sexual? To make hazy the ways that men and women complement one another. Wouldn't you want to confuse the definition of what marriage really truly is? Well, of course you would. And that's why it's so important to, to realize and to understand that when we talk about the subjects of homosexuality and gender identity or, or transgender issues, we need to do this very thoughtfully, very carefully and with the utmost respect, regardless if those people are being respectful to us. You know, it just doesn't work well when we demand Christian morals from those who are not Christians. Uh, we're to lift people up with the Bible. We're not, we're not supposed to beat them down with it. And I'm personally just horrified when I hear people quoting the Bible um, to people who don't believe in the Bible, and they'll beat them down with something like 1 Corinthians 6, 9. The Apostle Paul writes this. He says, Don't you realize that those who do wrong will not inherit the kingdom of God? Well, don't fool yourself. Those who indulge in sexual sin or, or worship idols or commit adultery or practice homosexuality or a thief or, or maybe you're a greedy person or you're a drunkard or you're abusive or you just cheat people. None of these people will inherit the kingdom of God. That's what the Apostle Paul says. As a Christian, we can't stop there. That, people stop at verse 10. You can't stop at verse 10 because verse 11 is what really opens up the door for us to have this conversation uh, with homosexuality and gender identity and transgender issues, especially. Verse 11 says this, some of you were once like that. Wow. Some of you were just like that. But now you're cleansed and now you're made holy. And you were made right with God by calling on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. See, that's where the relationship comes in is verse 11. Some of you were just like that. You get to share with people that you were once blind and now you can see. And you get to share with them the amazing story of how you came to know the Lord. And I would encourage you to share that story because until they know your story and where you're coming from, they're not, they're not going to want to hear the Bible. They want to hear your story first. So look, guys, I know this is a messy issue. 
I and I want to encourage you to engage in the messiness of homosexuality and transgender and gender identity uh, issues and conversations. And I want to ask you again, I think I asked you a couple of days ago, ask yourself, why do you believe what you believe? And then can you explain it in love? One more quick thing here. Let me recommend visiting the new website at DustinDaniels.org. It's got a brand new look and you can access over 200 radio shows and podcasts that deal with all areas of sexuality. You can also email me your questions through the website as well. I would love to hear from you and uh, address all of your questions on the air. Once again, that's DustinDaniels.org. Thank you so much for listening to God, Sex, and You. You can follow me on Twitter at Purity Pastor, on Facebook at Dustin Daniels Radio. 1 Corinthians 4.20 reads, The kingdom of God isn't just a lot of talk, it's living in God's power. And that power, my friend, is the very name and the shed blood of Jesus Christ. Walk worthy today as you cling to Jesus. I love you and I look forward to our time again tomorrow. Tomorrow.